All right, here we go. Salute to Knicks Nation. Special edition of Knicks Fan TV, man. This is an honor and a privilege to have my special guest on today. He's a Grammy Award winner, a Source Award winner, among many, many accolades. One of the best MCs to ever come out of this city. Queensbridge's finest, Mega Montana, a.k.a. The Realness, a.k.a. Call Mega, man. Welcome to Knicks Fan TV, man. Thanks for having me, my man. Man, I got to tell you, it's, it's an honor to have you on. I remember back when The Realness came out, The Testament came out. I was a senior in high school, mm. just starting to drive. So you got the system amped up and <laughs> the new Mega drop. And, and you, you just never know who you might meet mm. later on in life, man. No doubt. And, and that's over 20 years. So it's it's amazing to, to have you on because we didn't even connect through music. Well... Through the speakers, we connected, but we connected through the Knicks. Facts. Through, through Knicks Fan TV, man. Yeah, so yeah. I appreciate the support, man. Likewise, likewise. I love what you're doing. Absolutely, man. Now, take me back to your earliest memories as a Knicks fan. Like, what were you some some of your favorite days growing up as a kid? Hmm, my earliest memory of Knicks fan first was uh being captivated by Bernard King. You know, I probably have faint, faint memories before that, but Bernard King is the first one that really grabbed me in. Yeah. It was like, wow, this guy's amazing. And I was young. And then uh, I remember he got hurt and he came back and then they didn't re-sign him. And I never understood that. And then um, my next uh, thing that really drew me in with the Knicks was when they signed Rod Strickland. I was like, wow, because that was like my favorite guy. And, um, you know, ever since then, I've been rooting for them. And then when they traded Ross Strickland, I felt sick. I was, I felt cringe. Um, but other than that, you know, I rooted for the Knicks. Um, obviously, that that uh, Mason, Starks, Ewan era, that team that went to the finals, that, you know, and everything after that, that next, the, the thing that got me the, the most excited with the Knicks uh, after that was when they signed Sprewell. Yeah. I was that was a good moment for me. Nine nine. They traded Starks for Sprewell, man. That was that was a controversial trade because it was like Starks meant so much to the fans and to the city. Mm -hmm. So it was hard. And then Sprewell coming off the controversy, choking out PJ Carlissimo. Mm -hmm. He didn't know which way it was gonna go, but Sprewell captivated the city fast. I mean, it took it took him a little while. He was a little bit injured with that 99 team, mm -hmm. came off the bench, he started, but by the end, he was locked in. With the he city, was free. He you know was free, man. Yeah. So uh yeah, I was so I was I was ecstatic when we signed him because I knew what he I was a fan of Spree, so I knew what he was capable of. So yeah, you know, that was a good that was a good sign. On, on the realness too, Man vs. Smith, that's one of my favorite songs. The last track on the album, first of all, Harry Fraud, one of my favorite producers. Mm. That, that's a fire beat, and it's a lot of wisdom in the in that track. Mm -hmm. And when you when you're talking about reaching your potential and having to lock in, having to focus, you said uh, lack of precision causes bad decisions, like the Knicks and passive interest for signing Bernard King. Imagine him, Patrick, and Strickland if a chance was given. It's like the path to winning detour by apprehension. Mm. That's a bar right there. Thank you, sir. Was that? You think that was the biggest what if in Knicks history? Just, just not for me having, it is. Yeah, Patrick and like, Bernard playing together. Oh my God, I think about that all the time because when I look at, like even that that Bulls team, we was we. There was so many times we was close to beating the Bulls, but this, there was this one time when Charles Smith just missed the shot. Oh, man. We would have won. Yeah, yeah. So imagine Bernard King, Strickland, right. with Ewing. Right. Because right. all that time we needed a guard and we needed a scorer. There's ain't too many guards that's more godlier than the point guard. Yeah. And Bernard King is a prolific scorer. He's the prototype to Melo. Right, right. You put those three together... I don't even want to think about it. I'm going to get sad. Back to back. I was watching um, Knuckleheads podcast and, and Dominique Wilkins was on. And he, said, he talked about how, how just how filthy Bernard King was. And he was like how Mike Fratelli used to tell him, like, you got to pick this man up at half court. Because mm. if you don't, he's gone. Wow. And, and his bucket's on your head. Yeah. I mean, back to back 60-point games with no three-pointers. Mm. Word. Crazy. Yeah. It's just crazy. And I think, it, I think it is the biggest what if in Knicks history, man, because 84-85 season, he has the injury. That gets him the number one pick in the lottery. They get Ewing. He missed the entire length of Ewing's rookie year because he was recovering from the knee injury. Then the next year, I think that was 86, 87, 
Ewing was hurt the first six games that Bernard played, mm. and then Bernard got hurt again. So they never, never got to play together, man. And, and three years later, Bernard came with the Bullets, made it back to the All Star game, third in the East in, in scoring. It, it's a, it's a tragedy, man. Yeah. Then they traded Strickland. They traded Trick Strickland February nineteen ninety, because because he uh he didn't, he wasn't satisfied with the playing time, man. I don't blame him. <laughs> But they but they drafted Mark Jackson and Strickland same draft. I know. I love Mark Jackson too, but Strickland was just different. Mark was good too, but Strickland was just different. Yeah. So, you know, they was both great, but they they could have found a way to work make that work like the, like we did with um Frazier and Earl. Who who was the best basketball player you ever seen come out of New York City? Whoa, that's a tough question. The best the best basketball player from New York City for me. Being a basketball fan, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Yeah. I mean, he was the most winning basketball player in history. He won more than Jordan did. Yeah. Jordan was a prolific college and NBA guy. Kareem, Kareem won in high school, college, NBA. I mean, his he's been retired for over 30 years, and his, and his, his uh, points total just got passed last week. Yeah. So that tells you how prolific he was. He never scored three pointers. He was a, a center. Centers don't even have longevity. He he lasted like he played late in his in his career. He was an all star still. Yeah. So I, I'm definitely gonna go with Kareem. What about plays that that you seen? I mean, you had, we you came up in the point guard era, right? Mm -hmm. And Mark Jackson, Kenny Anderson, uh, Strickland, Kenny Smith. Who would you think was the was the best of that group? Strickland's my favorite. Yeah. So I'm biased. Uh, I uh, I seen Kenny Anderson play; he was spectacular. Mm. Um, I've seen other guys that that didn't make it to the NBA that was good, but my favorite out of all those guys was Rod Strickland, hundred percent. Hundred percent, man. What do you think about today's team? At the time of this recording, six games <laughs> over five hundred, sixth in the East right now. Okay, we're gonna get deep. Yeah. Me and you've had this conversation last yeah, year. Absolutely. I told you, and I quote, and you might remember this. I like our young core. I hope they don't trade them. Yeah. I seen the potential in them. I like this group. I really think RJ has to step it up or he's going to have to be a, a trade commodity. I think if we would have got Mitchell, this team would have been a threat. So you kind of you regretting the Mitchell trade? I'm kind of regretting not getting Spider-Man. If you put him with Brunson yeah. and... The way Julius is playing, and the way the and and I love that heart, that heart acquisition. Yeah, I love R that. A big, big over. Yeah, so I just need RJ to step. We need consistency out of RJ. And the first few years, he does grow every year, but he also has a relapse every year. Right, right. So it's like uh, the negatives, you know, erase the positives sometimes yeah. with him. So I just need him to lock in. Um, I like Sims. I just what the Knicks lack right now. That I that I noticed, mm. we don't have development. Mm. Like we need somebody to, especially those bigs, because we have a few bigs that are good. Yeah. Remember Houston, they they hired Ewing as a big man developer. Yeah. And they had Akeem also. Right. So you had guys like Yao and some of those bigs that benefited from having tutelage of uh Akeem and Ewing. Yeah. So who's 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 give God in these guys? We don't need... seem like teams have a big man coach these days. Yeah, we don't need that. Like... We need that. Everybody's abandoning that because they're thinking of the small ball game, but just think of fundamentals and teach them that and they'll they'll adjust it. So I like our team. I like our team. I just think we need a little tweaks. I love Brunson. I said that when when, when they Brunson, first signed him, when crazy. people was, was was bugging out. I like the acquisition of heart because Life, not just basketball. Life is a chemistry thing. Hart and Brunson have chemistry. Right, right. So that's going to benefit us. And they like playing together, and they both go hard. Yeah. Um, like I said, RJ, we just need him to go hard. Julius Randle, I like Julius Randle. I just don't like Julius Randle trying to be a point forward. Yeah, yeah. It's I need, never worked. Don't do it. It's, it's never worked. Um, and I need him to defer. Learn to defer to Brunson, especially in those clutch moments, because yeah. Brunson has gotten us out of a lot of situations. Yeah. So let him defer a little and keep playing his game. If if Julius like study Ainge and Duncan, he'll be a problem. He's already nice. Yeah. But if he grows in some of those areas, he'll be a beast. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, our center. Yeah. What do you think about Mitch? 
I like Mitch, but he's always hurt. He's always hurt. My only two issues with Mitch, I like his defense a lot. My only issues with Mitch, when you look at the box score, he might have a decent amount of rebounds. He's going to do his blocks, but I need you to get more than eight points a game. Yeah, that's 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 I usually get the that. av- yeah, that's you know usually what I'm average, right? Yeah, right. I can't, I can't, you can't be that guy with eight points a game. Yeah, yeah. like thug it, do do what you got to do, get some more points, get a double double every game, Mitch. That's all I need from you, and to stay healthy. But I blame our coach for that too, because uh, first of all, he gives these players too many minutes. Um, if we're blowing a team out. Go to the bench. There's yeah. no need for, for Brunson to be paying 40 minutes when we're up 20 right, and the right. game is, is almost over. Right. And there's especially, and there's no need for Mitch to play those, those minutes. And if people are coming off of injuries, work them slowly back in. Let them, if you used to play 30 minutes, but he just came off an injury, let them play 25. Let them work it up. Yeah. So we just need to, you know, we need that balance. If if he balances the minutes, and and my other gripe with, with the coach is. From a business perspective, mm. he wasn't. You don't utilize your bench the right way. If you got guys on the on the bench, first of all, me seeing D Rose on the bench, I think that's so disrespectful. Mm. But I'm giving Tibbs the benefit of the doubt. I think on the low, he might be saving him for the playoffs. Could be you insurance know, so policy. I hope that I hope that's the case because because. Yeah. Uh, Rose basketball IQ is off the charts. So we need somebody like him in those big moments. And there's games where we play against elite players. We got Brunson and we got other guys that are gritty, but grittiness ain't gonna get it against eliteness. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. you gotta match, you gotta match elite with elite. Right. Yeah. So when I see D Rose on the bench, I it just makes me scratch my head. Seeing Cam Fournier and some of these other guys, some of these guys aren't they bench minutes? Yeah. But somebody like Cam and them, if you knew you didn't want to play them. Play him when it's garbage time and play him in some of these other situations so you could get his value up for a trade. Right, it right. Ben- benefits everybody. But if you just have guys sitting on a bench, that's a problem. And in a recent poll, NBA players were asked which coach would they least want to play for, and Tibbs want was the top coach they don't want to play for. Yeah, yeah. That's a problem. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've been so, you know, hot and cold with Tibbs, man. Yeah. So, especially this season. You know, some of the games, especially early in the season, I just felt like, damn, like, I think you might have lost them. And then they go on an eight-game winning streak. And they come back five-game losing streak. Like, it's just been so hot and cold. But, you know, it seemed like they they are playing hard for him since he made the adjustment to the rotation. They've been playing a lot better. I think they've been on pace as a as a 50-win team mm. when he made that adjustment mm. based on all, all the metrics and everything like that. You know, the, the hard acquisition to me, I think Hart is, a, he's a Thibodeau type of player. I love that acquisition. Yeah, yeah he's tough. He, he plays physical, plays, plays he, he just plays hard. You know, first game, he gets it. First thing he did was get to the free throw line. Just attacking a basket, being more aggressive. He's starting to shoot threes a lot better. He was yep. only shooting about 30% from three. So he's starting to shoot the threes a lot better. I think him and Quickly in that backcourt in the playoffs. I love Quickly. That, that's going to be a tough duo to deal with. It's going to be a problem. Yeah. Quickly has stepped his game up in year three, man, especially defensively. Yeah. They, they rely on him a lot to, to lead that bench. I told you last year, I said, I like our core. I like yeah. our young guys. Because at the end of the day, if you tr- if you trade the whole house for one guy, you still got to replace all these guys. Yeah. There's, there's not necessarily a replacement for what Quickly has given us. You know what I'm saying? So let's just home grow. Let's home grow some talent, which we're doing. We got some Good piece. We get one more star. Yeah. The Knicks is, is really over yeah. the top. But I see, I think that's why the Mitchell trade was so hard for me because number one, I wasn't really trying to see them trade RJ just yet. Like mm-hmm. number three pick, homegrown talent. And even though he he doesn't have elite skills or athleticism, I just felt like through his work ethic, he's just one of those guys that will figure out a way mm-hmm. to be productive. Now it hasn't come along this year, but I was just a little bit leery to trade him. And then you might have had to attach quickly in that trade plus mm-hmm. multiple picks. Mm-hmm. So then, but yeah, you get Mitchell and, and with Brunson and Randall, you formidable. But it's just it's just, you just not sure what you could build with after that mm-hmm. once you gave up all those pieces. So it was yeah. it was a tough trade to to make. But um, I like where they are right now. Me too. You no, know, I like where they are. Six games over five hundred. They got a chance to to crack four, the top four. Mm. And I think that's the sweet spot for me. You want to be able to see like a Cleveland in a four or five matchup. Mm-hmm. So I, like I, don't, I don't think they're at the top tier with the Bucks, Celtics, even the Sixers. But I think like the Cleveland four or five might, might be able to make some noise, man. What do you think? I, I totally agree with you. 
I totally echo those sentiments. Yeah. And I'm excited. Yeah. And yeah, you know, with, with the Rose thing, like clearly from a, a, a skill-wise, you're taking a step back, right? For all the time, catches up with everybody. Mm. But I thought there were games where his experience, you know, the, the, the experience that he has up here as a former superstar could have helped him. Exactly. It, it, I think it, it could have helped him. So never know. It might be an insurance policy for the playoffs or somebody get injured. They went through the whole trade deadline, didn't trade him, didn't buy him out. So it seemed like he want to be here anyway. He def I, I commend him for his um sportsmanship and his leadership. Yeah. Cause he's showing players how to do it the right way. Um and you and me both know this is warm-up. This is warm-up. The playoffs is the real season. Yeah. And the playoffs, this is checkers, the playoffs is chess. Right. Every game is gonna take thinking from the coaching to the to the players. And that's where I think. Uh, roles would be formidable, especially if you consider what we did in the last playoffs. Rose was the MVP of the last yeah, playoffs. Yeah, he came up big. You know what I'm saying? Because he he's been there, and 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 the game slows down right in the playoffs, and that's his that's his forte. So let's see what happens. Yeah. If we make it to the playoffs, I love Brunson though. Don't get it twisted. Yeah. I love Brunson, but when he after Brunson, what do we got? I like quickly too, but quickly is a combo guard. Yeah. So I like quickly, but we need Rose in there. Let's 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 mix it up. Let's mix it yeah. up. I, out of everybody, and I even like Forn, I like um, Fournier. Uh, not all the time, but in some mixed matches, especially with his height, we could use him against some of those short two guards. Yeah, and and for defensive purposes, sometimes even though he sucks at at um, defense, he has the length. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, like I said, I love Hart, and I like our chance. I like our chances just from that Hart acquisition that alone. Was that was big. That was that was major. Yeah, and. Uh, I hope they get the last the last Villanova guy that was part of their big three next year. Yeah, Macau Bridges, right? If we get well, see, him. When he, went to, he went to Brooklyn, man, I was like, damn. Because you know the Knicks and the Nets never never do business. Yeah, man. yeah. That's tough. When's he a free agent? He just got a bag. Oh, oh did yeah, I Yeah, he just got a bag. So that that was the thing. When he went to the Nets, man, I was like, because they should have drafted him. Mm. They had a chance to draft Macau Bridges. They drafted Kevin Knox. <laughs> you know, Macau right. Bridges was a slam dunk pick in that draft. When you watch him in the Big East tournament, you watch him in the in the NCAA tournament. The Knicks needed a three and D wing that year. He could he could solve a lot of their problems, man. A lot of our drafts. If we could have, if we could um, if this was the Knicks end game and we could get those Infinity Stones yeah, and Time yeah. Stones, we'd be good. I'm telling you, because uh, there's a lot of mistakes we made in the draft. The biggest mistake in the draft in the recent in the last twenty years that yeah. nobody wants to admit. Walsh was the biggest dud. And that draft, when Steph Curry came, first of all, y'all let everybody in the world know that we was gonna get Steph. Right, right. They so, played their card, they played, yeah. they put the cards on the table. So people that don't like us out the gate was gonna try to <laughs> screw us. And then where he messed up at, I know you probably remember because you 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 know your stuff. Mm. Washington was offering us the number four pick for uh I forgot the guy. I could look at you could look it up. Yeah. They was offering us the pick. Mm -hmm. If he would have did that trade, if he would have did that trade, we'd have been able to get Steph Curry at number four. And they got Jordan Hill instead, man. <laughs> Jordan Hill. Yeah, the Rosen was out there, and they went with Jordan Hill, man. It's it's a lot of bust, man. What about uh, what about Frederick Vice for for Ron Artest, man? Where were you when that went down, and what was the reaction from from Queensbridge, man? I probably was right. I probably was in. I think the whole Queen thought he was going to the Knicks. <laughs> we probably was yeah. happy and excited, and, and it was definitely a downer that day. That yeah. was like a gray cloud was over the hood. It probably was sunny outside, but a gray cloud was over the hood. And the funny thing, if you look in, uh, I don't know if it's the Daily News or the New York Post, mm. Ron's first basketball game, they not they they mentioned me in the article because I was there. I was at Ron's first games. Uh. So I flew out to um, for first games with with the Bulls. Yeah, or? when he played for the Bulls. Okay, okay. So after he got drafted, obviously it wasn't the Knicks. So yeah. when he played for the Bulls, I flew out there and I seen his first games. But I was like, not, I thought he was going to. Everybody thought he was going to the Knicks. Wow. So that was like, wow, that's and, crazy. And then when we do get him, it's late. And then he leaves. He leaves because remember he had another year on his contract. Yeah, he asked yeah. him out. But right. if, he, if he knew that we was gonna get Phil, he said he would have stayed. He would have stayed. What well, could have been another what if, man? That's what yeah. we're doing is, is going through what ifs, man. And we're talking to the legend Core Mega. His album, The Realness 2, is available now on all streaming platforms. So make sure you check it out. What was, uh, I mean, what was your early, you know, just coming up in Queens Ridge and, and watching a guy like Ron Artest 
out there putting in work? Like, what, what was your early impressions of him as a, as a player? Ron Artest is like one of those Rocky movies. Like, when you see Rocky, he wasn't technical. He wasn't as savvy as some of the other boxers. He was all heart, grit, and devotion. They could make a Rocky movie by Ron Artest. Mm. I'm telling you, no exaggeration. It'll be a day like it's freezing outside and nobody's out except hustlers and people who shouldn't be outside. Mm -hmm. Ron is outside shooting a basketball. Mm. It's raining, it's cold, you're not comfortable being outside. Ron is outside shooting a basketball. Work. His father, if they do a movie about Ron Artest, his father will be the co-star. They, they, whoever, His father will be one of the main characters in the movie. His father mm. trained him vigorously and... Ron is the epitome of where hard work, hard work will take you further than talent. Because mm -hmm. there were people in the projects that was better than Ron, mm. but they didn't work as hard as they Ron. As they didn't want it as much as Ron. So he became better than everybody. You know what I'm saying? So that's what I remember about Ron. Dedication, dedication, grit, grit, grit. Like, you'll be looking at him like, it's crazy. It's snowing outside. Why is he outside shooting a ball? And then when you see him, <laughs> then when you see him lifting that championship trophy, yeah. it all makes it sense. It all makes sense. You know what I'm saying? So... That's what I remember. Hard work, dedication, mm -hmm. grit. It's a lot of stories that uh, that people can take from that. Your album, the the realness too. What was the overall concept of the album? Well, the realness too. I was trying to. It's a sequel to the realness, mm -hmm. and I was trying to make something consistent with the first realness. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to um, just throw out something with a number two on it. Mm -hmm. So my challenge was to make it as good or as better than the first one. So it was a tough album to make. Um, I wanted to assemble the right production team. I didn't want it to be too nostalgic. I wanted it to be modern too. Mm -hmm. Thus we have Harry Fraud, the street runner. Mm -hmm. And then um, I wanted to have minimal features, but strong features. So the concept was just go hard, make it, make it sound good and make it feel something like younger and mature people could enjoy. You said there was a lot of pressure on you. Mm -hmm. When you to to put this album out because of all of the acclaim that the first album uh, uh, came with. Yes. So what was that process like when you're in the studio when when you, you you're writing your your bars? Well, did it take you a little bit longer to make this one? Like, what was the process like? I'm gonna give you a perfect example. You see this episode that we're doing. Imagine you're not doing this episode with me. You're just doing it, mm. and then when it's done, y'all like it's good, and then you're like, "Yo, erase that. Let's do it over." So these guys got to come back and do this whole album again. <laughs> And then another day you're like, eh, I think we could do it again. Like there was many songs that I did over numerous times. Um, Harry Freud, he mixed that song 21 different times. Man vs. Myth. To get it right. Wow. 21 wow. different, that shows his dedication. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. shout out to Harry, I, I, I love him for that. Yeah. Um, you know, we wanted to make the fans proud. We wanted to give hip. That's why I, the song, me and Nas never did a song with just me and Nas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when I did that song, Glorious, everybody lost their mind because it's like, wow, this is what we've been wanting. Yeah. So we mm -hmm. gave them what we wanted. And then Lloyd Banks was the surprise of the album. Nobody knew that I was working with Lloyd. And then Havoc was on there. So that's the three features. Every, I wanted everything to be a moment. And then um, I try to make sequel songs to some of the popular songs that was on The Realness. Mm. So that's that's how I formulated it. They're gl making Glorious... Had to have felt good to make that song with Nas, just mm -hmm. based on the history that y'all had. You know, you were close and you fell out, then you came back close again. You won a Grammy with him, so mm -hmm. it had to be rewarding to to make that track on because you say you got ne never made a track like that before. Yeah, yeah, it was definitely rewarding. It was rewarding for the fans, um, and it felt good for me. I did that song mostly for the fans because his friendship means more to me than anything else. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, uh. Like he got a big show this week. Mm. I didn't even call him up to MSG. Yeah. yeah. I didn't call him up to see if I'm gonna perform or stuff like that. You mm. know what I'm saying? Because mm. he's my friend. I don't want it to seem like a lot of people in this industry, their relationships with you be uh with an agenda. Transactional. You know, right. 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 I don't want transactional friendship. I want him to know I'm your boy, like from the heart. Yeah. Like if I perform with you or not, you my man. If we do music or not, you my man. Like as long as we good, we good. All that other stuff is, so that was important to me, but the fans wanted me and him to do a song forever. And it felt good. And seeing the reaction from people when it came out, it was beautiful. That's dope, man, that's dope. You know, when you talk about yourself, you talk about Nas, uh, some of my favorite artists, you Nas, I look at Styles, 
Mm. Lloyd Banks. Mm. How do you, because cause you 50, how old are you, 50? 68, man. No, man. I'm 68, look it up. Huh? <laughs> I'm 68. No way. No way. Huh? No way. I yeah, got Wolf the Engineer said, no way. No chance. All right, look it up. Look it up, and then we'll talk on the next episode. All right, we we, we gonna talk in the next episode. But the, but the point is, <laughs> when I when I, I look at you guys and I see that the, the blade is still sharp, man. Mm -hmm. And when I listen to, and it's no knock on, on the newer music, but the art of storytelling is missing, mm -hmm. in my opinion, it, it's missing. I look I listen to I look at the the newer music, just me personally, as you know, something I can rock to at the gym, or if I'm hooping, or if I'm out at the club, or something. You know, it's a little vibe, but mm -hmm. the storytelling is missing. How do you stay consistent? Even though you took a little bit of time off in, in between albums, how, how do you stay consistent? A Jedi is a Jedi. Like a lot of these guys rap for money mm. or they became rappers because they was too lazy to get a job and too scared to hustle in the street. Mm. Rap looks easy to people. So it's like, I take this very, Rakim said I take this more serious than just a joke. This is my life. Like rap is everything to me. Hip hop is everything to me. A dope rhyme is everything to me. So staying sharp is 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 like exercising. It's like um, and there's a difference between having bars and being a lyricist. Mm. And there's a difference between being good and being elite. So I'm always pushing myself to be great. And the, everybody that you named a little while ago, I worked with every single one of them. Mm. And I admire every single one of them. So they all, the dope rappers always inspire me. And me, being that I was underrated, I'm always going to have that little edge. edge. So it's like I'm, I'm trying to prove to the world that I'm just as good as anybody. I'm not saying I'm better than anybody. I'm just as good. You can put me on a song with any rapper that ever existed, and I'll be able to hold my own. That, that's what's up, man. What would you say is the difference? You know, 20 years between Realness 1 and Realness 2. Mm -hmm. What was the difference between Core Mega then and Core Mega now in writing those albums? Less, much less profanity. I barely use profanity on my music. Mm. Um, Family show, no doubt. No you know doubt. what I'm saying? I barely use profanity on my music, especially mm. um, words that offend women. Mm. Um, I'm a father now. I didn't have any children back then. Um, and I know who I am as an artist and as a man. When I made the realness, I didn't have nothing out. I didn't even know the multicultural impact of rap. In other words, like when you come from the streets, sometimes you only you can't see past those buildings. So I didn't know people of other races and cultures listen to me. Mm. So first time I seen a white girl that knew who I was in Massachusetts at a mall, I was like, how the hell does she know who I am? Mm. You know what I'm saying? And then um, she was like, I like your stuff. And then I, I was like, okay, she's she's like different. Like, And then I had a show that night and there was a lot of people that looked just like her. It was all at my show. They knew all the words and everything. Mm -hmm. So now I'm like, wow, now I'm going to different countries. I did it, my first show after the realness in England. I see people that look, I thought I was in the wrong place. There was people like with spikes on their neck. Like I'm thinking this is a rock and roll spot. Yeah. Like different kind of people. They all knew my stuff. So it's like, wow. And it's like, uh, you know, the fans, it used to be fan mail, now it's DMs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. People from Africa, England, Spain, Australia, New Zealand, China, Japan, all around the world write me. Or people tell me how my music affected their life. Like your music helped me get through a hard time or bop, bop, bop. So now I see myself as I have a responsibility with music as opposed to, I want to be the the live rapper from the hood now. So that's the difference. I, I have more purpose now. I have more responsibility now, and I know who I am. When when because as I said, it's a lot of it's always a lot of wisdom on your albums. But did you feel like you you had that responsibility because is is that something that was missing in, in when you came up in the game? Um, no, because when I was coming up, there was always a rapper that said something that that resonated with me. Mm. Slick Rick said, men don't steal and most don't borrow. If you smoke crack, your kids will smoke crack tomorrow. It's kind of spooky. It's like, yo, don't mess with drugs. Mm. And he's like, men don't steal, most don't borrow. That's like teaching you in, 
integrity right there. Mm -hmm. um, so Rakim said certain things that that I absorbed. There's always a gem, but there wasn't a bunch of gems. But the mm -hmm. the people that gave gems, I grabbed it. Um, MC Shan, like, um, stop walking through lights if you are blind. You should reach for your goal like I'm reaching for mine. You know, so it's like, okay, there was moments when I was in a dark place and they gave me light, enlightenment, mm -hmm. light. It's time for me to give light because mm -hmm. the most selfish you could be is with knowledge. You could you could be selfish with money and 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 you're just playing yourself. But if you sell selfish with knowledge, you, you're hurting a bunch of people because that can help so many more people. So it's a goal now to give gems in my music. Every song on The Realness has a gem, has gems in it, every single one. One of, one of the biggest supporters of, of the Knicks fan TV wave is, is Chuck D, Rhyme Animal Chuck D, Public mm. Enemy fame, and, and I appreciate him every day. He, he never misses a show. He's in my show before I even get there. Every night after the game, he's always there. Mm. What, what did he teach you? Chuck D taught me so much. That's like big bro. Um, Chuck D once told me something like, he's like, your music is like God, or something like that along those lines when he said it to me. And it almost made me want to cry. Like, cause it's like, like Chuck D is like everything to me. It's like, you know, it's like when your idol's acknowledging you. Mm. So it's like, wow. So my relationship with Chuck D is special. I look up to him. He's like a mentor, even when he's, even indirectly. Um, I had the honor of being on a Public Enemy album before. So that's one of my highlights of my career. Mm. Um, so Chuck is just a very cool dude, down to earth dude. I learned a lot from Chuck just from watching, you know what I'm saying? Um, he leads by example. He's never embarrassed us as a people, as a culture. Yeah, that's a fact. So he's just, he's he's very, he's a very iconic and, and integral part of my life and my culture. We're talking to the legendary Core Mega. His new album, The Realist 2, is out on all streaming platforms. So make sure you guys check that out. And Darius, you got to check that out too. 68. We, we got to verify that, man. I, I don't believe that whatsoever, man. So <laughs> double, double check the Wikipedia. Um, Wiki is fake. Do not acknowledge them. <laughs> I could tell yo, I hate that. We, me and my fans have spoken about that. I hate that. They, yeah. they don't they don't got they don't got nothing right. So, uh, speaking of fans, in, in past interviews, you, you talked about how in the earlier days of, of promotion, how you would connect with fans. Talk a little bit about that because obviously the platforms have changed now in the Instagram era, mm -hmm. Twitter, YouTube, and all of that. Talk about some of your early days of how you connected with fans and, and what you're doing now. All right, in the early days, the first thing I used to do was I used to try to answer as much fan mail as possible. Then I found out about websites, mm -hmm. right? So I'm not computer savvy to this day, mm -hmm. but then there was a site, uh, I think it was called Mega Central, and I, it was dedicated to me. And I'm like, wow. So I met the guy and they needed a computer. So I gave them a laptop, right? And then, you know, there was a, sh a site dedicated to me. So I used to, they had a forum. I used to come on the forum and talk to fans. Mm -hmm. And I would get their feedback directly. And it was like, wow. Then after that, we had Cormega.net. Cormega. Legalhustle.net. Mm -hmm. And then we had the forum again. I used to talk to the fans directly. Um... Some of those early fans became my friends. Some of those fans got my phone number or got my email, and you know, and I and from them I learned what they wanted from me. Like, do a song with this guy, or we like this. We like when you rap like this. We like you with this guy. You sound very good with this producer. I learned a lot about me from them, and vice versa. So I started talking to the fans a lot, and then um, people used to tease me. I, I remember one of the comments on one of the social, uh, one of the. Websites was Mega got too much time on his hands. Mm. Like you should be in the studio. Mm. Not they didn't understand it. And then I and then I started talking to fans on uh, MySpace. Remember we had mm -hmm, MySpace. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then from MySpace I went to Twitter. Twitter was my thing for a very long time. And then uh, a sister named Hannah from England was like, "You need an Instagram." And she started my Instagram for me. Mm. And then I took over. And ever since, and I've been running since. So, mm. Insta, those those things are integral. And I met I met you on Instagram. Yeah, yeah. So those things are very powerful tools of communication, of marketing, branding, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely. And as you said, you caught flack for that. People say you had too much time on your hands, but they're not understanding at that point that that one on one communication 
That's how you build in your community. That's how you build in your loyal fans. And that's how they sustain you throughout the course of your career. Everything. Pays dividends. Innovators are often met with resistance. I bet you if you t- if you told somebody, yo, I'm going to make a Knicks uh, fans yeah. thing, when you yeah. first did it, somebody probably thought you was crazy. All the time. And like, now the Knicks is so trash. How you do it, man? How yeah. you do it? So yo, it's bigger than the team, man. The thing that I love about Knicks fans if somebody's a diehard Knicks fan, it says a lot about their character. I, I say that all the if time. If you're a Knicks fan, you're a loyal person. One thousand percent. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. So that's a character trait for sure. And as far as people uh, having something to say about people's moves, innovators are often met with resistance. Everything I've ever done, the same people that have something to say follow my footsteps. Or mm. people laughed when I went independent. Mm. People laughed when I made a mixtape. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. they giving props to rappers that made mixtapes in the early 2000s. Like, oh, these are the first guy. My mixtapes was out in the 90s. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? I got teased for that. When I went independent, I got teased for that. When I talked on uh on the computer, I got teased for that. But people don't tease me too much more now. Now they just copy my moves. Yeah, yeah. So like my guy currency, my guy currency, yeah, that's all he does now. You know what I'm saying? That that's what's up. Um, and and before we go on the on the independent track, you were incarcerated in 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 the 94, right? You came out in 95. Mm-hmm. There was a lot of hype around your name and and you know a lot of anticipation for your upcoming work. And the Testament was one of the albums that got shelved. You dealt with a lot of, of politics in the industry. What was it that made you stay focused and, and push forward towards an independent route? You know, in dealing with all of all of the politics that comes in the industry. You even said uh, that that the industry is kind of like a horse stable. Right, mm. where it's they they focus on the best and and try to put the rest out to the back. So how did you stay focused? I stayed focused because, like you said, politics. The politics are so uh, oppressive sometimes. A lot of people quit. There, was, there were many days and I was like, I'm done. I'm just done. Yeah. And then um, it's people, it's fans, it's people that really believe in you that'll keep you going. Um, so it's people who told me to keep going. Like my man Blue, rest in peace, one of the guys, and mm-hmm. fans, like, Mega, make your when when you coming out of the album, blah, blah. And I knew the industry was giving me flack. It was there was obstacles, there were hurdles, there were roadblocks. So I said, you know what? If I go independent, I don't have to deal with these politics. Mm-hmm. If I go independent, it's me directly to the fan, as long as I have a fan base. So when I went independent, um, my album took off, and I didn't expect that. I do. I knew it was gonna do good, but I didn't think it was gonna do that good. Mm. So, when I put out the album, it it was it was the number one new uh, Heat Seeker album on Billboard for two weeks. I was the number one new artist in Billboard for two weeks in a row, mm. and then um, it grew. And then the very next year, I put out another album. I won the Source Award, and then I got another award. And then it's like people just started getting my respect, and then my following just grew and grew, and they stayed with me, those people. So after a while, I was like, okay, I don't need the industry and the politics and all of that. I'll just deal with my fans. So that's what kept me going. And that's what, you know, I've had major labels holler at me after that and I and I declined or I didn't, I wasn't even interested in it because I didn't want to deal with politics again. Well, what are some of the challenges you saw in, in going independent? The challenge of independent is, it's all mental. It all depends on how mentally, your mental fortitude. Mm-hmm. Like, if, if you go independent, you're not gonna have the visibility as somebody on a major. Mm-hmm. You're not gonna be the household name like somebody on a major, uh, unless you have a machine behind you. So a lot of the things that major label artists were privy to, I would have to work extra hard for it. But I was willing to work extra hard. They made me work hard, that hard, period. At, up to that point in my life, I might as well keep going. So. I knew I wouldn't be on the radio as much. I wouldn't be on TV as much. I wouldn't have everything everybody else have. But if the music is right, I would have my fans. And if you look at mainstream artists, they don't have longevity, a lot of them. They'll have, uh, there's a lot of artists you can't even name four albums. Mm-hmm. Like you're hot, 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 you're on fire. The next album it cools off. By the third album, they're they ready to get rid of you. Mm-hmm. So it's like, uh, I kept, feeding my core audience exactly what they wanted. I never deviated from what my fans wanted. And then it grew and it grew. And it's like, if you look in a billboard, I could show you billboard um, copies from billboard where I was 
on top of the Migos mm -hmm. as far as like numbers on the Billboard. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't be like that now, obviously, but you know what I'm saying? They got the machine behind them. Mm -hmm. I never got the machine behind me. Um, but I had the fans behind me. Like mm -hmm. for somebody that was suspected to come out in the 90s and to come out with an album in 2022, even nowadays, artists come out with an album. Let's just say it's uh, February, what's today? The 21st? 21st. Somebody coming out with an album 21st, by the by March 2nd, you forgot they came out with an album. Yeah, yeah. By April, it's like the dude never came out. Mm. That's spooky. The fact that my album came out months ago and people still talk about it like it's new mm -hmm. is a blessing. And it just shows the power of music and the, and the power of that fan base. And, uh, and that those people that never really heard me or that overlooked it, when they hear it, it's like, wow. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that's a blessing in itself as opposed to me being on the major, getting all this hype and all this buzz, then put out the music and, and nobody gravitates right, towards right. it. So that's that's the blessing right there. So I like I like work, I like being an underdog. I like grinding. Was there anyone who anyone in particular who kind of showed you that independent game, or was it more just trial and error that how you learned? It was trial and error. There's two artists that was independent. Um that I seen them being independent, but I didn't go in depth with them about it. Um, one was E-Money Bags, mm -hmm. rest in mm -hmm. peace, and the other one was Bumpy Knuckles. Mm -hmm. So they went independent. And um, I like how they hustled. It's like hustling. It's mm -hmm. like you doing what you want to do. It's like having a mom and pop store as, as opposed to a chain store. Yeah. So I like the idea of it. And then um, when, when, when it was time for me to do it, I did it. I did, I did not know the results would be like this. And like I said, my first album came out 2021, no, 2001. Mm -hmm. We're in 2023 and, and I have more music coming and people are still talking about this album. So the challenge with this album is that I still don't have a m big machine behind me. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the stuff on this album, I did myself. Like I need, uh, like I finished the entire album by myself. Mm -hmm. When it was time to handle the the course for the mixing engineer, I did that. When it was time to handle the course for the mastering, I did that. When it was time to get the album cover, I did that. When it was time to do the videos, I handled that. So it's like I'm doing everything. So it's like uh, with the buzz that this album has, if I had a machine behind me, it would be even bigger. But with the blessing of the fans and God, you know, I'm here still. And um, we just shot another video the other day. Mm. That's what's up. And, and then in terms of uh, upcoming work, any anything you have um, coming up? Yeah. Your guy that you spoke of, Holly. Yeah. Uh, me and Harry Fraud, we have a beautiful album together. Um, it's the most unique album I've ever done. It doesn't sound like the realness. I could say I was trying to channel the realness too. I was trying to channel the realness, of the original one. Mm. The Harry Fraud album sounds unique from anything I've ever done. It's like an art gallery for your ears. Um, me and Havoc supposed to be working on a project. We have a couple okay. of songs done. We don't have a as much as me and Harry Fraud. So, and then I got like a, a Lost Tapes type of album, like the, yeah. the unreleased. I have a lot of songs that never came out. You might have heard on a mixtape or something. Mm. So it's like that. So I got those three projects are the main, main priorities right now. But the Harry Fraud one is the one I want to get out the way. You work with Havoc for, I mean, how long have you been knowing Havoc for? I knew Havoc for most of my life. Yeah. I knew Havoc when he had a, a high top fade. <laughs> so and he was famous for a very long time with a yeah. bald head, so yeah. that says a lot. Well, what's that creative process like when you two get together? I get excited when I work with Havoc um, because Havoc is a humble genius. Um, he underestimates himself, mm. and he's so talented, and he's so... Um, unique in his own way. Like you never really had too many Havoc joints that sound the same. Right. Like, and he lasted for generations. Like when you think about it, Shook once came out in 94 or five. Mm -hmm. And that was a super hit. And then Jada Kiss Why came out when? 2000s? Yeah. And Havoc produced that. So, yeah, yep, so it's yep. not too many producers that come from this era and then trans transition into this era and then transition to still make heat. And Havoc is one of those guys. So Working with him, it's easy. It's like his beats were made for me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's, the chemistry is perfect. 
Yeah, absolutely, man. Shout out to Havoc. Rest in peace to Prodigy for sure, man. And we're talking to the legendary MC called Mega, man. The realness too. In not in stores, but on streaming platforms now. So make sure that you guys uh that, that you guys check it out. One one of the comments you had made in a previous interview in terms of what, what you didn't like about the game is that we walk into a lot of these boardrooms and and you know, a lot of these places, uh, they don't look like us in there. Yeah. So it's like I'm in, I'm in a um bakery in France. <laughs> how how do we change that? Um stop being for sale. Mm. Like, a lot of people get into different coaches and different positions from buying their way in. Stop letting people buy their way in. Because a lot of times when people buy their way in, they restructure things. And the guys that were our gatekeepers and our foundations, they get pushed to the side. One of the names you mentioned earlier was Chuck D. His name should be mentioned amongst the greats. His name should be mentioned way more than it is. Mm, absolutely. But... You, when you start speaking when, of knowledge of self and upliftment, then people try to muffle, mute that sound. Mm -hmm. So people, when you look at some of the pioneers the top, and the top guys that was in rap that gave us knowledge and, and gave us jewels, like you said, they all was one kind of people. And, and a lot of them had knowledge of self. And now there's barely any of that. It's like, just make a fool of yourself and we're going to pay you. So... We have to start respecting our, our architects, our, our creators, our originators, and try to build on that. Like when Mike Tyson was in his prime, he was studying boxes from the 40s and the 50s and mm. study greatness and, and emulate it and, and add on to it rather than dismissing it and trying to claim yours as it. I think we need more of that. I think we need more um, active people putting their money into our culture, we need a magazine that's not that's not ad driven because mm. you're ad driven and anybody could get in there just paying for an ad. Mm. Um, we need more people that are going to say enough is enough. I'm taught like me. There's certain things I've never heard of until I listen to certain songs. I never knew what Molly was. Yeah, I never knew what. Uh, there's a lot of things I don't know what it is. I hear it and I'm like, what's that? And I find out what it is. And I'm like, wow. And I'm like, this is on the radio? Mm. So it's like, you know, I remember there was a time when you could talk uh, reckless on the radio, late night shows or, or the mix mm -hmm, shows, mm -hmm. not school hours. Yeah, like, right, right. You know Three o'clock, five times. Yeah, like yeah. I could leave this interview with you right now and turn on the radio and hear something that I'm yeah. not supposed to be hearing. Yeah, yeah. So, and then kids is listening. So who's that? Kids are, are very inquisitive mm -hmm. and very... Uh, easily influenced. Yeah, yeah. So we have to be mindful of that. So we need more gatekeepers keepers that respect our culture and that respect the purity and integrity of the art as opposed to people that's chasing the bag. Absolutely, man. And and uh, last question for you. How do you want to be remembered? You know, what's, what does the legacy of, of Core Mega look like? Um, Original, unique individual. Um, Loyal. Knicks fan, so I got to be loyal. <laughs> Um, I was never for sale. Um, I did things my way, but I was willing to listen. Consistency and just a New Yorker, a New Yorker. Absolutely, man. Final prediction for the Knicks this season. Hmm. I think... Knicks are gonna make it to the third round. To the Eastern Conference Finals? I think the Knicks might make it to the Eastern Conference Finals. Eastern Conference Finals. There it is. Wow, okay. Okay. So maybe it's uh maybe it's a Knicks Celtics Eastern Conference Finals. Bring it back to the 80s. I like our chances. Because everybody else that's in the East, um, I think we've beaten everybody that's a, that's that's good in the East this year. Except yeah. maybe, did we beat Milwaukee this uh, year? That's what I was wondering. Did we beat Milwaukee? Because last year we beat Milwaukee we did beat a couple them of last times. Year. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't think, so. not in Milwaukee. We definitely didn't win in we Milwaukee. We didn't beat Milwaukee. Yeah, Everybody I don't, I don't else that's we good, we beat. Year. We yeah. beat the Nets. We beat the Celtics. We beat the beat Heat. The Sixers. Beat the Heat. We beat the Sixers. Yeah. And we beat the Cavs. And the Hawks, it's not even a threat to us nah, anymore. No, nah, no. Nah. It's like we, that's over. Yeah. And like I said, the addition of heart, when we got heart and people moan, um, 
I could tell a lot of people really don't study the game or mm -hmm. they don't know personnel. Mm -hmm. Heart is good. There's two kind of trades that happen often. Mm -hmm. You either get traded a lot because people want you a lot or you get traded a lot because you're expendable. Right. People want Hart a lot. Yeah, if you yeah. look at those teams that he got traded from, a lot of yeah. those teams did not want to trade him. Yeah. Or it's like, even now the Blazers probably had to do it because they have because he's about to get that bag yeah. and they didn't have it. Yeah. So well, he, he got traded for Anthony Davis, the first trade. Right. Lakers to Pelicans. So you got to pay to play. Then he got right. traded for CJ McCollum. You see what I'm saying? You got to pay to play, man. So if it's somebody good, they're gonna want somebody good. Yeah. People want Hart. So when we got Hart, I was very happy. So I like our chance. I think we're going to sneak into the third round because we're going to definitely make it out of first round. And the second round, I think we're going to match up against somebody that that we're, that we're able to beat. And then um, I think we're going to make it to the third round. There we go. There you have it. Prediction. Call Mega Lock It In Eastern Conference Finals, man. Well, listen, man, it, this has been an absolute honor and a privilege for, for you to come on this show. Likewise. Yeah, man. We've been we've been trying to make it happen for some time now. Hopefully they make the playoffs. You got to pull up on us at 40-40, man. A 40-40 is rocking season opener. I'm there. All right, man. Lock it in. Call Mega Mega Montana, man. The Real is 2 on streaming platforms now. Make sure you guys check it out. Hope you guys enjoyed today's interview. Peace. Oh, <laughs>